right hand corner. Thank you. And um, Aaron, we're recording, so uh, we can Great. start whenever you want. Thank you. You didn't push it very hard. Now it's on. Well, I mean, we'll start us off. Different kind of bell, but a bell nevertheless. Um, we want to hear us do the recording. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Bloomington Rotary Club's weekly celebration of service for April 21st, 2020. I'm the current club president, Aaron Davis, and it's just great to have everyone here, wherever you are, uh, including our special guests. Um, thanks for being here. So I'd like to now introduce Efrat Pfefferman uh, for the pledge and then a reflection following. So Efrat is the executive director of United Way of Monroe County. Thank you so much, Aaron. It's so good to, to see everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, how have we been doing the pledge? Are we standing up or should I just go ahead and go? <laughs> uh, we're okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United, United States, States of America. 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 And to the republic, the republic for which we stand. With the nation, one God, visible, visible, liberty, justice for all. Thank you. That, um, we had a, a virtual Passover Seder with my mom's congregation, and it kind of sounded like that for an hour. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm humbled um, to be here. Um, speaking to United Way's efforts, and it's great to see my counterpart from uh, Bedford in the South Central Indiana United Way, Kim Burgess, mm -hmm. here as well. Hi, Kim. Um, <clears throat> early March, uh, you know, we, we started hearing the concerns springing from um, nonprofits, specifically in our world, the social services um, nonprofits, and the anticipation of um, the changes that, that will need to be made um, in terms of things like hygiene practices and how they, they serve um, our most vulnerable um, populations in this community. And so it was at that point where we realized this is, this is gonna be, um, this is gonna be something that, that we need to start taking action on. Um, not only are we, at this point, we were talking about increased costs of, of hygiene and sanitation and things like that, but we were also seeing the um, cancellation of fundraisers that uh, nonprofit agencies rely on so heavily to um, maintain their income, which allows them to provide services. So, over the course of those couple of first weeks in March, it, it really scaled up into something a lot larger, um, as we all know, and every day, uh, you know, brought forth uh, a new level of considerations and, and things to respond to. And so we were seeing it, it was going to be a lot more than just buying some hygiene items, right? Um, and supplementing income. Um, there are gaps that became apparent in our community, and I really have to credit the people on the ground for identifying those. Um, when we think about our, our homeless um, population, individuals experiencing homelessness, uh, you know, currently crammed in shelters, right? Um, Friends Place, Wheeler, those are not places where everyone has six feet apart to spread out. Um, and so the immediate uh, need for isolation space and then physical distancing became apparent. And um, uh, that, that is for the whole sector, not just for one agency. And the other thing that we were really concerned about was our food supply in our community. And we were hearing that from Julio at the food bank uh, because the supply chain was starting to be affected and not knowing what's in front of us, we really needed to get on top of that. So it was with those considerations as well as the individual agency 
um, <clears throat> considerations that we decided to launch the relief fund, the COVID-19 emergency relief fund. We launched that on March 17th, I believe, and had spent a few days pulling together some key partnerships that made this happen. Uh, the Bloomington Health Foundation with a donation as well as offer to match individual donations, the Community Foundation, Monroe County Government, Bloomington, City of Bloomington, several of our townships, several businesses, uh, IU Credit Union, Cook, um, several that, that some of you are involved in, and then individuals who were already reaching out to ask and see how they can help. And so we launched that fund with over a quarter of a million dollars already announced and continue to raise funds in the days to come. And then we're able to um, do a first round of funding that targeted the isolation space needs and physical distancing needs in the homeless uh, shelters, as well as the food supply and then dispersed um, $300,000 to those two projects and to 16 other agencies serving vulnerable populations and basic needs. That was the focus. It was you know, food, shelter, um, basic health and safety measures. And um, I think that was a timely response. Um, and then, you know, since then we have continued to work with our our colleagues in the philanthropy world, uh, Tina Peterson, John Berta, especially uh, grateful for their partnership, not only in shaping that fund, but also um, we all serve along with Diane Bazell and Dan Smith on the mayor's social services task force, which has been um, tackling um, areas of specific need and putting out recommendations for short and long-term recovery. Uh, I think we'll have some good news in the days to come um, about a key partnership with the Lilly Endowment, and I'll look forward to sharing that as we move into phase two of um, funding nonprofits and social services in the community. Uh, but I just wanted to say how, how humbled, um, humble but not surprised I am at the, the generosity of this community. And Rotarians, we exemplify this um, really more than any other group. You, so many of you have um, have reached out to make connections, to donate, to ask how you can help. Um, and, and this is really where I see, you know, and reflect on the shared values of the United Way world and, and Rotary um, in terms of the understanding that we have a shared responsibility for our world and for those in it and those of us who can do, do. Uh, to the extent that we can, um, matters of equity that intertwine, you know, through these themes in terms of when something like this happens, um, who's, who's most affected and then, you know, how do we um, address those inequities and, and just that sense of fellowship that, that um, you know, I, I see here and I see through the United Way effort and, and the, the overlap, um, we're all in this together. I, I say that a lot. I know it's, it's sort of a cliche, but we all are in this together. And I think we're all doing, all things considered, a really amazing job. And it, it just brings a tear to my eye um, to sit back and, and pause and reflect on that. Um, and so I, I just wanted to say thank you. and. Um, I, I look to, to Rotary, this group, and, and all the others um, to continue from here in, in partnership, um, continuing to, to pivot when we need to, to be creative when we need to, and uh, to, to build these, these deep connections um, for the better good. Thank you. Thank you, Efrat, and thank you for your leadership and the tremendous work that United Way is doing in these incredibly difficult times. Um, thank you. A and we do have uh, a project that, that the Rotary Club, Bloomington Rotary Club is working uh, with uh, the United Way and we'll be talking about that more in the future. Um, but right now, I want to ac actually greet a few people who haven't been mentioned. Uh, Joe King, Sarah Laughlin are here. And uh, well, we have 
scanning around. Uh, Tim Jessen's here, Liz Irwin, and uh, Natalie Blaze is here, our executive administrator. Chris Michael uh, is here, and uh, Mike Baker, Len Tiemann. Good to see you again, John Diltz, uh, Bill Perkins. Yep, Bill Perkins, hello. Hi. And Jean Emery, Sandy Keller, uh, Tina Swanson. Uh, and I'm not sure who Oliver's second is, um, but we also have, uh, oh, Kelly Eskew and Byron Banger, Kate Cruikshank, Clint Baugh, and uh, Aaron Brewington, uh, Leslie Green, Amy Osajima, um, Megan, and uh, Becky Jesmer, Kyla Cox Deckard, and wow, it's a great turnout. Thank you, we have 64 people so far. So I uh, especially want to acknowledge our greeters, uh, Jim Bright, Ashley Sullivan, and Katie Beck, uh, and production supervisor, Ellen Barker, a roundabout reporter for April, our editor, Judy Schroeder, and uh, thanks to Michael Shermis and Katie Beck for helping members and guests find their seats today. Uh, and now let's introduce some of the people who are literally guests. Um, Jim Bright, do you have uh, anyone to introduce? Yeah, thank you, Rand Aaron. Randy Wheeler. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Aaron. It's my pleasure to welcome back past sister governor Judy Bush of Bedford. Judy, good to have you with us today. Um, Randy Wheeler, our district secretary from uh, our largest club in the district at Evansville and Lynn Tiemann uh, with Bloomington Sunrise. I hope I'm not missing anybody, but welcome uh, to all of our uh, Rotary guests. Great, and then Katie, uh, did you, or Ashley, did you note anyone, any other guests besides uh, Owens? Just Owens guests, yeah. Okay. Uh, Corinne Lindahl is here, I believe. Right, right. so Owen will, will, Owen will introduce uh, those guests. Um, thank you, Aaron. Uh, I am pleased to introduce two members of my family. Uh, first, uh, in Monmouth, Oregon, sitting in front of a picture of the town we grew up in, Pullman, Washington, is my brother, Kyle Johnson. And um, a special guest, uh, a Rotarian, her father was a Rotarian. Um, her grandmother and my grandfather uh, were brother and sister. And she is a past president of the Sundbiberia Rotary Club. And I've asked her to speak for a minute or two about Rotary in Sweden. Velkommen. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, every. Uh, uh, it's nice to be in this meeting, and it's very it's interesting to be in a foreigner country. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm from Sweden. I'm in live in Stockholm, and uh, I'm not going to talk about the Corona virus today. But we have a hard uh, city, a uh, hard time here in Sweden. Uh, and the uh, Rotary here in Sweden, we have about 26,000 person who is a member of a Rotary club. And we have uh, 550 Rotary, different Rotary clubs in Sweden. Uh, and we have also a protector of the Rotary and uh, the protector here in Sweden is the King of Sweden, called the 16th Gustav is the protector of the Rotary organization in Sweden. So that's, that's a little about Rotary in Sweden. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and it's so wonderful that whatever travel restrictions and uh, physical distancing restrictions don't apply here. So we're just delighted to have uh, a guest from Sweden today, a Rotarian. Do we and have thank you, Owen. Do we in the United States have a protector of Rotary? <laughs> just, we just wonder. Sorry. It's a good question. Maybe that would be for a reflection uh, in a coming week. Perhaps yeah. the Constitution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps the Constitution. So I'd also like to make sure that all those who are signed in without you know, video 
are recognized. We're just very glad to have all of you here. Uh, your engagement is deeply appreciated. And now, so welcome everyone to Rotary in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, our Rotary family, we have birthdays this week, and there's one incredibly special birthday. Uh, Paul Harris, April 19th, uh, 152 years ago, uh, was born and uh, the founder of this organization and our protector in deeds and, and ideology and just plain compassion and, and good work. Uh, so happy birthday to Paul, Paul Harris. Happy birthday to Rotary. Uh, Joe Darling, no less important, <laughs> is, uh, has a birthday April 20th. Uh, Peggy Frisbee, April 21st. And Mike Baker, who's here, uh, April 23rd. Happy birthday. And then uh, membership anniversaries. Hal Turner has been uh, a member for nine years now. And Marilyn Wood, who's here for five years. So happy membership anniversary to everyone. Rotarians in the news. Well, our Rotarians are always in the news, obviously. So check the HT and other local media, Bloom, including our Facebook page, please. <laughs> Come visit us and, and like us. Uh, examples. Scott Shackelford continues to be quoted uh, widely on cybersecurity issues. Uh, and then another character we have in our club, Trent Deckard, uh, Rotarian and Kelly School of Business lecturer, who's the subject of a wonderful write-up in the IU News uh, Bloomington campus. So we'll post that link, uh, Judy, I would guess, in the roundabout, and you'll be able to check that out or, or come look at the Facebook, uh, club's Facebook page. Um, and now uh, Mike Baker, will make an announcement about our nominations, about our club's future. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, the nomination committee presents a uh, slate of officers and board members for election by our uh, club members. Uh, that'll be voted on uh, Survey Monkey, I think, within the next few days. So I'd like to present to you the slate president nominee, Sally Gaskell, treasurer, Tyler Cox Deckard, Secretary, David Meyer. The board of directors, which is a two-year term, both Jim Sims and Ron Barnes. So congratulations for all of you to be willing to serve our club and uh, looking forward to having you all on board. Uh, and I think Natalie will have that sent out in the next couple of days, so. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And thank you, and thank you everyone. What, I, what I'd like to, to do is just have a, a moment of fame for everyone. Um, of course, this is going to be uh, Ashley Sullivan's year as president. And uh, so I'd like uh, Sally Gaskell to just announce, you know, give your name and what you're uh, nominated for. I'm Sally Gaskell and I'm being nominated uh, for the position of president elect. Okay. And uh, is Kyla here? <clears throat> I'm here. Okay. Just wanted you to be on board. And what are you nominated for? Uh, treasurer, second year. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dave Meyer is here. Yes, I'm nominated for secretary. Um, looking forward to uh, another year at secretary and, uh, and getting some more done, figuring out with uh, Trent how to market uh, membership <laughs> for the coming year when we may be physically apart a lot. Okay. And then two uh, board members continuing terms, uh, Jim Sims. Hello, thank you. Um, okay. Being nominated um, to serve another term or a full term, I should say, um, right. on the board. Um, uh, maybe I've brought some things that maybe help the club and help um, what it is we're doing, but there is so much more to learn and I'm looking forward to it. Um, and everybody just stay safe, please. Right. Thank you, Jim. And then, and Ron Barnes. 
Well, I'm honored to be uh, nominated for a second term on the board. I love serving Rotary, and I can, hope I can do justice to my nomination. Thank you. And thank you all for your willingness to serve and to others who are also uh, doing important work in various committees. Uh, I'll mention a little of that in a moment. Uh, Rotary Action Updates, most of these I'll, I'll just mention briefly. Read the roundabout, please. Catch up, the roundabout and also on the Facebook page. Our last meeting had over 80 members and guests. Uh, mm -hmm. Please keep encouraging members who haven't made it to a meeting to attend. Um, we're talking about continuing to have tra virtual meetings as an option for members who can't make it uh, to the physical meetings even after the in-person meeting is returned. So that's mm -hmm. something to think about. Accessibility. Um, our, board, our board and committees are active via Zoom and uh, email. Community Services Committee has announced a district matching grant and our communications committee and program committee members are leading the production of these virtual celebrations of service. If you have, or your committee, have any need uh, for help with Zoom or other technology issues, please let me, Natalie, or Alan Barker know. Uh, I want to announce that our club scholarship committee, chaired by Matt Stitzinger, has selected four high school scholars to be presented at our May 5th meeting. So that's something that's always heartwarming, a wonderful program uh, to look forward to. And it's wonderful that we're continuing to do that during these times of uncertainty for our high school graduates and, uh, and others. Um, also join us at our next Rotary Zoom Cafe to socialize uh, weekly on Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Check out the May issue of the Rotarian on page 27, uh, District Governor Shia Smart, last week's guest from Australia, is featured. And on the following page, our own District Governor, Santana Naidu, is featured. Both are younger District Governors working full-time and raising a family. Next year, our District Governor will be Jessica Hain from Bloomington. Happy dollars. Anyone happy about anything? Of course, you can bank the dollars for now uh, to be sent maybe to United Way or Teachers Warehouse. Um, Dave Meyer? I got one. Uh, my uh, second grandchild is uh, two months, a little more than two months old now. He smiled uh, for the first time this week and oh. my daughter sent me a little video of it and that was wonderful. Wonderful. Good. <laughs> yeah, this is Charlotte. Can you hear me? Yes, Charlotte. Yes, I, I happy ten happy dollars, twenty happy dollars for for the Rotary scholarships. I, I I'm on that committee, and that was a pure pleasure to talk to those young people who applied. We're very lucky to have a lot of young people in this community who are really just amazingly committed to community service and who are academically very, very promising. So that was a wonderful thing. We should be very, when next week when, or two weeks from now when we announce that, it'll be a big celebration. This was a very, we worked very hard on this and it was a ple pure pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you to the committee. Thank you. And who's next? I have happy dollars. Hey, Rosie. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I actually have happy dollars. One for the, uh, Artie and I were uh, helped Ashley in judging the young students for the speech contest. And that was really, I think a very empowering event, not only for them, but for us as well. And I'm glad we were able to participate in that. It was, it was really, I think very well done considering the circumstances and just feel very good about it. So I wanna thank you for that. And I have one more happy dollar. Artie and I, also known as Rosie and Mr. Rosie, made a happy video for the um, Sycamore Knolls Home Association. We're supposed to do a live event and we couldn't obviously, and asked if we would make a video for their um, neighborhood and we did. 
and it was so well received and very happy. So we're we're happy to offer happy dollars for that as well. It's on oh well, yeah, it's have, on YouTube. <laughs> well, can we can we have the link? Can you send me the link? I can send you the link. Please, yeah. I will. I will. Thank, thank you. you. And and thank you again to to Ashley Sullivan for coordinating the district speech contest and and for the volunteer judges, uh, Rosie and Artie. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Over here. Oh, Artie is right here. He's just sitting one chair away. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to just see 66 of your faces here today. Um, I'd like to offer $66 for the teacher's warehouse because I know that when we all get back to school, um, there's already talk about every kid needing their own supplies so that they're not sharing germs as much. And I think this will be very timely of an effort. So that's, I'm just happy to see you all. And that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, this is Liz Feidel. I'd like to report that my husband is scheduled to come home from rehab on Thursday, April 30th. We're both so excited. Thank you all for your wishes. Wonderful. Good. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, any anyone else? Since we have three screens, it's a, a little bit hard for me to monitor what's going on. Jean Emery, hi. You're always having things to be happy about. <laughs> of course I'm happy. Here. <laughs> yeah. 10 months old. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. So how much do I have to owe for this? <laughs> How's that? But my grandson is 10 months old and he's wonderful. So thank okay. you. Okay. And yeah. Natalie, we don't yeah. get to hear from you much. Natalie Blaze. Hi, I'm here. I got to spend some time with my granddaughter yesterday. We did a, a 12 car parade for my niece's 11th birthday down in Mitchell. There was about 30 of us participating and, and we tried to make her have a, a wonderful day despite all of this. Okay, and the Chris Michael, CM. Hi. Yeah, I'm just uh, happy to report that uh, Wheeler Mission Bloomington, our Center for Man, we have no one who's tested positive thus far for COVID. So a huge blessing there. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, let's move on to the introduction of our speaker for today. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Engel, you have the floor. Okay. Thanks, uh, Aaron. Uh, our speaker today, I think, is a really remarkable person. Most of you know her, uh, Ann Askew, uh, the wife of our fellow member, Dr. Phil Askew. Uh, Ann has had a, just an amazing career in pediatrics, 43 years, wow. nurse practitioner entirely in the field of pediatrics. So when we Think of somebody who has uh, experience and knows what she's talking about when we're talking about children, Ann Askew really knows. Uh, she's, um, she has a, a bachelor's and master's degree in nursing from IU and went on to get a post-master's certificate as a pediatric nurse practitioner. Uh, she's worked uh, in Raleigh Hospital for children, and also St. Vincent and uh, IU Hospital North and a number of uh, different positions from bedside nurse on up to uh, chief uh, nursing officer. Uh, I thought that was chief of naval operations, but uh, I guess she hadn't gone that far. She corrected me. Uh, so, um, but she's had a wealth of experience uh, taking care of children and um, uh, several years ago became interested in the study of adverse childhood experiences uh, on how that affects the children. And since most of us are parents or grandparents, uh, I think that what she has to say, and I'm certainly looking forward to it, uh, what she has to say about this 
this relatively new um, field of study, adverse childhood experiences, that she claims that it, are actually threatening our society. So I'm uh, eager to hear what Anne has to say, and I hope that we all are too, and that we can relate what she has to say, our own experiences as children, parents, and grandparents. So please give a, a warm welcome. I, I haven't covered her entire bio. It's pretty thorough, but uh, she did move to IU or Bloomington. She and Phil moved down here in 2017 and worked she worked for the IU Bloomington Hospital as Director of Women and Children's Services until she retired in February. So Anne has a wealth of experience in the area of pediatrics and childhood behavior. And so I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to Anne Eske. Please give her a welcome. Thanks, Steve. Uh, there, I see you, Anne. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear Great. you. I appreciate that introduction. I appreciate you for having me today. Um, you gave most of my introduction, so I won't have to speak a lot. I will say that Steve had asked me back in early January to speak uh, to the Rotary Group. I think that was following a conversation with Phil. And with my involvement with the IU Health um, and Regional Academic Health Center, they felt like I could speak to that. Since I retired in February, I didn't feel I was probably the best candidate to give that talk at this point. So hopefully in the coming year, you'll be able to have someone from the marketing department come, thanks, sorry, someone from the marketing department come and give you an update on the progress of the Regional Academic Health Center as we're all seeing it come out of the ground quite fast now. So things are really on track for hopefully opening the end of 2021. I'm gonna ask um, Alan to put my slides up. Thank you very much. Last week or over the course of this past week, you were asked to complete the Adverse Childhood Experiences Survey. Um, it was a quick little survey, just 10 easy questions. Um, I wanted you to do it in the privacy of your own home, really to just give you an idea of what the questions are. We're gonna speak a little bit more about where they came from, but to give you some idea of what we're looking at. There are no right or wrong answers. Um, it's really just a starting point for healthcare providers and those of us in the community to really understand what those adverse experiences are and how they can affect the long-term outcome of a child. We're not gonna share any results. I don't want people to be sharing them or anything, but just think about what your answers were. Think about how maybe some of those events have impacted you through the course of your life and how you've dealt with them as we move through the presentation. Next slide, please. Dr. Robert Black um, is a, a very well-known pediatrician in the United States. He practices at the University of Rochester in Minnesota. He's actually a past president of the American Academy of P Pediatrics, and he's been highly involved in the work of not only the ACEs committee um, through the uh, CDC, but also um, spoken nationally on behavioral health issues. He's really the one that's looked at adverse childhood experiences as being the single greatest unaddressed public health threat facing our nation today. Since April is Child Ab Abuse Prevention Month, I decided that this would be a great time to really get the word out about ACEs, what they are. Um, it's really no better time to raise our awareness of what ACEs are. I know there's a lot of teachers in the group, as well as just business people in knowing what their employees are going through, um, and as well as what resources may be out there. Uh, but to look at the long lasting effects of child abuse, neglect, and other types of childhood trauma. Next slide, please. This slide just really speaks to what ACEs are, the definition being traumatic early life events that can lead to negative health outcomes as adults. They include not only violence and abuse, uh, but are um, 
also affected by growing up in a family with mental health issues and substance use issues. I'll speak to toxic stress in a few minutes, but it's really the toxic stress from ACEs that affect the brain growth and development of a child. Next slide, please. The key is ACEs can be prevented. And that's one of the things in raising awareness, really looking at the surveys that are done and dealing with those responses, getting people into programs and services that are available that we can stop the perpetual flow of um, abuse in our society. Much of the work that was done uh, around ACEs comes from a collaborative study out of the CDC and Kaiser Permanente in, in San Diego. They actually conducted the study between 1995 and 1997 and looked at 10 types of childhood trauma and their impact on the long-term well-being of the child. The researchers identified three major types of trauma, uh, three categories, and those were abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. The study concluded, not surprisingly, that the more adverse experiences that are um, affecting a child, especially earlier in life, the greater the risk of significant physical, emotional, and social consequences in the future. Not too surprising. Um, we think about a, a child with a difficult upbringing, possibly having hardships uh, down the road. However, the interesting part about this study was that it was um, completed on over 17,000 participants who were primarily white, middle to middle upper class, college educated people who had stable jobs and also um, had, um, I'm drawing a blank, stable jobs, college educated and healthcare, sorry. So they all had the, the privileges of actually not having ACEs in their lives. However, they did. Next slide, please. 64% of these people had at least one ACE on their survey and 25% had three or more. So when you think about that from the population of this study, that's pretty significant. What it showed was that they were at increased risk for chronic disease and health issues, uh, primarily being COPD, depression, um, asthma, diabetes, heart disease, um, and also um, impacting their social skills, academic achievement, and work performance. Next slide, please. So I mentioned toxic stress earlier and um, just a little bit about pediatric and child development. Uh, to the brain, stress is stress. It doesn't matter what kind of stress it is. But a child's brain develops extremely fast during the first three to five years of life. That's the highest rate of growth of the brain itself. So when you think about it, being exposed to those um, events can have a very negative impact on the outcome and the experiences of the child. Chronic stress negatively affects that learning and also the growth and de development of that brain. Next slide, please. So preventing ACEs can help children and adults thrive and lower the risk of conditions such as depression, asthma, cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. It can reduce highly risky behaviors such as smoking, drug abuse, and alcoholism. It can improve the education and employment potential of a child. And finally, it really helps to stop the flow of experience passing from one generation to the next. Next slide, please. This slide's rather busy, but I really just wanted to show you um, that what the potential reduction of um, negative outcomes could be if those ACEs were addressed. And it really shows that with proper um, education as well as intervention for ACEs, um, there could be a 44% uh, 
uh, reduction in depressive disorders in the United States. Likewise, those healthy risk behavior, behaviors and socioeconomic challenges could also be addressed. Next slide, please. So how do we raise awareness about this and how can we help? Um, the raising of awareness really looks at how we can change the progression, um, ideas that we can do both from a uh, personal perspective as well as community solutions to shift the focus. So we're really raising awareness to help change how we think about the causes and moves us to how we can actually approach the causes and fix them. Next slide, please. Through anticipation and recognition, healthcare providers can make proper referrals to um, effective services and supports such as substance abuse treatment programs and parenting interventions. As employers, they can look at their policies and perhaps address ideas such as paid family leave and flexible work schedules. States and communities can improve the access to quality childcare, uh, working with our school systems for after child programming, um, offering family involvement within the schools, as well as providing mentorship opportunities, career workshops, programs to enhance parenting skills, ideas such as that. And I know our uh, community here in Monroe County has an, a wonderful Boys and Girls Club program that really does address some of the needs that families can partake in and help with this. Next slide, please. This is the part I really wanted to speak to. When Steve did my introduction, uh, one of the things that I was privileged to be a part of at IU Health Bloomington when I came two years ago was a group of people, uh, both healthcare providers, uh, members of the outpatient as well as inpatient settings, social workers, case managers, physicians, nurses, as well as community members. And these were volunteer community members that came in. We met weekly uh, for an hour. And what we looked at were some of these issues in relation to adverse childhood experiences. So uh, this was a, a program that um, had been started and we really kind of switched our focus on what could we do. One of the things that was uh, going on at that time within our community was our Southern Indiana physicians, our pediatric practices, had implemented the use of ACE screening in their office visits. They weren't doing it all consistently, nor were they doing it with every patient. But over the course of our work in that first year, we really got it rolled out to all of the office settings so that the survey was done consistently with all their patients. Additionally, we worked with our OB providers within IU Health and got them to start utilizing the survey during prenatal visits. And they would identify those patients that were at risk with higher ACE scores. This really was kind of the starting point for what we did next. Um, as you're aware, when you do surveys, you've got to have some outlet of what you do with the results. And that was one of the things that we were finding while it was great to identify these kids or mothers, what were we able to offer them? As a result of that, um, two great programs were started over the last two years. The first one um, you may have heard about is the Nurse Family Partnership. Mm -hmm. And that's been in existence for a, a couple of years now. Uh, this program links pregnant women that are identified in that prenatal period as being at risk. Preferably, we like to get them hooked into the program prior to 28 weeks of pregnancy, but again, um, we've had some that have joined um, the program after that. What it does is it hooks a nurse up with that mother in the prenatal period. She follows that mother through pregnancy, through delivery, and then works with the mother and the family the first three years of that child's life. So it's a really key, not only program for 
um, helping the mother through that difficult time, but also kind of a mentorship of parenting skills, how to work with that infant, um, how to take care of herself as well as her family, getting them involved in jobs. Um, so it, it really is, it's been a great program. It's actually throughout the whole South Central region. And Amy, Me Amy Meek leads that program and she does an excellent job. Um, I know they could do more if they had more volunteers to, to help with that um, and had more involvement to be able to, to take that throughout the region. The second program is one that's um, newer and it actually is a grant that was um, developed. It's a grant funded program with IU Health and it's called the Family Vitality Initiative. And this uh, program likewise focuses on pregnant women who are struggling with substance abuse or they may actually already be in a substance abuse treatment program. It also entails the father who also may be struggling with abuse um, and they actually work to get the mom into services, um, establish her health care with a perinatal or a prenatal provider, um, and working with um, them to provide them with the services that they're needing. By linking mothers uh, with substance abuse issues early in pregnancy and getting mother into those programs, as well as dad, um, early access to services, plus having an RN following mom and baby um, into that second or third year of life, um, it really can have a very positive impact and it also helps the, the family navigate the system. So that's my little talk in a nutshell. I really appreciate your time. Um, thank you for your attention. And I wanna leave you with this thought, if I could have my final slide, Alan. Maybe. Life is such a great thing. Remember, celebrate everything, live each moment, and always love a child. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And do you have uh, time to stay for a few questions? Sure. Okay, well, does anyone have a question? Just to put it in the chat sure, I, or? I do, I do. Okay, uh, Steve. Uh, Ann, um, you alluded to a survey that you sent us. I never got that. I'd be curious if, if was that sent, supposedly sent out to all the members? It, it was in the roundabout. Oh, okay, I guess, yeah. I guess that's where I didn't see it. I'll send I just it want to take the survey. I'll okay. send it to you. Okay. Thank you. I, I have a question. How do we how do we get to the people who really to whom this really who for, who would to applies? And I'm thinking I worked at Middleway House, and I think you know that was a a place where I think we see a lot of the results of these. Is how do we get to the people who? eventually end up at Middleway House or some of our other agencies. How do we get there? Well, I know with the survey being done, we, we actually looked at a starting point and that was having the survey within our pediatric practices. Uh -huh. So all pediatric practices are now doing this at all their um, well child visits with patients all throughout the South Central region. So that's key in really looking at where kids fall currently and then working with um, our key providers as well as those in the community to help them address those. And then our programming with our prenatal patients really was to focus on that age group um, mm -hmm. to help them as well. Well, the, 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 the what do you call the, the portrait of the people who are involved in this with the percentage with white middle class educated people, how they, I suppose our, our pediatricians are most likely to reach them. Is that right? Yes. We have, a, we're lucky to have a really good Southern, Southern Indiana pediatrics group, I know. We also, have the best in the state down here, yes. Uh, and they take Medicaid patients and I think that's remarkable. Yes, they do. 
Yeah. And they're okay. very good at collaborating with both in hospital and out hospital uh, mm -hmm. providers or social workers to get families into services that are needed around our area. The um, Family Vitality Program, the initiative that I spoke to, they actually are putting together a kind of resource books for the office settings to utilize so that we know what, what services are available in our community that they can then refer patients to. Wonderful. Wonderful. And, and I, I would just like to ask, if, if we're talking about the middle-class population there largely, uh, what's the nature and the scope of the problem with uh, those in chronic poverty and those who are medically underserved or not served well, at all? And I think that was the key to the, the um, actual study that was done that got this off and going, was that if we have that kind of results within a population of well-educated people that have access to health care, then what does that really mean for our underserved population? Right, right. And that's why it became evident with that study that we had to do something to address those ACEs. And mm -hmm. that's the actual, actual recognition and then also getting them into those services. You know, mm -hmm. we have a huge opioid population here in, in Monroe, or not Monroe County, but in the South Central region. And that was one of our issues that we were really looking at with women's and children's services was how can we impact this? You know, we want to keep our families together. These moms are pregnant and they, for the most part, want to keep their babies. They want to have their family. So working with them through the nurse family partnership, getting them into services, making sure they're getting to their treatment visits, making sure they're getting their medications, as well as looking at the long-term outcome with the baby, uh, once the baby's delivered, what does that mean? Um, those children have some sequelae from having been exposed to yeah. drugs. So dealing with that, teaching mom parenting skills, teaching dad parenting skills so that they can address the child well, and then treating the infant so that they're growing well, um, that's the real key and what we're really focusing on with the program uh, here in the South Central region. Thank you, Anne. Thank uh, you. We're going to wrap up the meeting uh, now, but if anybody, are you able to stay a couple of minutes late if sure. anybody else uh, still wants to have questions? Sure. Uh, this work is so important. It meets so many of our rotary values. Uh, so thank you very much for, for doing it and for promoting the, these ideas that are so important in society. Thank, thank you. you. In, in honor of today's celebration of service, we'll provide this quarter's local charity donation to Centerstone, a United Way agency. Now, Ashley Sullivan, if you're here, could you uh, mention next week's program? I could if I had it in front of me. Um, I okay. apologize, Aaron, could you introduce it? And I'll just gladly oh, endorse it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that would be. Uh, so next week, uh, April 28th, on Zoom, our speaker will be Jane Rogan of the Indiana University Center for Rural Engagement. And Charlotte Zitlow will be introducing her. Yeah. So sorry, Ashley. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thought of the week. In honor of Paul Harris's birthday, uh, which was April 19th, a quote from him. This is a changing world. And he said this in 1935. We must be prepared to change with it. The story of Rotary will have to be written again and again. Wonderful. Wise words from our founder. Um, so would you join me in the four-way test now, please? Of the things we think and do. First, 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 is it the truth? Second, third, all concern. Third, 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 third goodwill, 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 better friendships. friendships. Or, 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 or be beneficial to, to, to concern. Uh,
and fifth of the fun. Thank you. I have a guest. I have a Thank you, everyone. You've done. Thank you, Anne. Can I, uh, What's the question? In the chat box about data, I see uh, Kim Burgess uh, registered that, and also um, the PowerPoint slides. So I guess the PowerPoint slides could be available on the recording of this. Is that right? Yes, they, the recording will include the PowerPoint slides, but if anybody wants them separate from the recording, we can do that as well. We can send them along. So the data question was, uh, who and where is the data being collected from the programs, and can they see that too? You mean the data from our programs at Bloomington? I presume, or any program that deals with this, right? Well, Anne, could you send some references, uh, some links yes, to... I Actually, the references were on my slide deck, so you'll have that. Great. I would. I. I have a question. Can you can you uh, list some some frequent or re repeated um, extra, adverse experiences that people have? Give us a kind of a picture of what you're what you're, you're finding. Well, I think one of the one of the questions was why COPD would be among those. Uh, yeah. So, did you get that and, question, Ann? I think I I think I did. I think all of your health related questions, the COPD, the asthma, really is just not in, is more related to not taking care of themselves. So that chronic stress. Uh, which I, I alluded to, the toxic stress. Yes. What happens when we all experience stress, our, our bodies release two hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. That's normal. That's a normal response to stress. So anytime we have some stressful situation, we um, have the release of those hormones. However, in the case of adverse childhood experiences, um, if we're repeatedly exposed to those things, such as trauma in the household, um, child abuse, neglect, um, just all of the different things related to childhood trauma that repeatedly releases those hormones. And so it's an overproduction of the hormones that actually affects the child's brain development. And that's what has the impact. It also has that impact on the health issues related to asthma, diabetes, COPD, um, and the depression, which is also a big one, and that's more from the brain growth. So it really has a, it's a result of that repeated toxic stress from the repeated release of those hormones throughout the course of life that has the effect on health. So when you look at people that, that weren't dealt with those ACEs during their childhood, and they continue to have that vicious cycle of being exposed to those issues, the drug abuse, the smoking, um, those things repeatedly have that impact on the health of the patient. And that's where you see the COPD and the asthma and diabetes. Uh, and add, if wow. we add in there uh, the effects of, of uh, let's say, a racist society, uh, different challenges, sexism that people may be enduring chronically every day you know, it doesn't stop. Uh, and we correlate that with higher incidences of all these diseases, including hypertension, Correct. which is another manifestation of the chronic stress. Uh, that's a pretty scary situation. Right. That, you know, as you said, that needs action. We well, need and I, think, I think when you look at the population that was uh, utilized for the study itself, those people were educated, yes. they had jobs, they had resources, they had health care. So they were able to deal with those experiences and move on from there versus someone that doesn't have that resource potential to be able to take care of that. So that's where we can work both from a community perspective as well as a healthcare perspective to really help identify this get these families into services, get the children into services that they need 
so that it doesn't become a vicious cycle as they grow up. I, one question I have is, is uh, belittling of children, the littering, putting them down and, and squelching them. Yes. Is that a form of neglect. It's a form of abuse and neglect, yes. That seems to me really vicious. And it happens a lot with educated people, I think. Yes. And I, that's one of the things in looking at some of the parenting classes that are out there and helping parents to develop those skills to better communicate with their children, um, that we're seeing some real progress made with um, with the situation. So wonderful. Thank and you. as you mentioned, we, we have more access to the health and needs of younger people and young parents. And the goal is to eventually reduce the problem in general for adults and even for seniors uh, through these interventions with, with young people. Yes. So that's such Mentoring important work. Mentoring is huge. Mentoring can be huge. Yes. And I think those in the, um, in the community as employers likewise can better understand what their employees are going through and helping with that. That was, we spoke to the, um, need for employers to have policies and procedures in place to really help families in looking at parental leaves and um, um, the ability to, to get the resources that they need. So it, it impacts all of us. It's not just in the healthcare arena, it's in our communities. And as long as we're recognizing it's out there and helping people get the services they need, I, I think that's key. That's wonderful. Wonderful doing that. Thank and you. I have a question about the nurse family partnerships. Uh -huh. um, first, how, how do people qualify for that? Who gets into that program? And how many, how often do these visits happen over the course of the pregnancy and the three years of the child's life? And then what is the follow up uh, or referral after that period? Well, um, as I said, it's, it's, um, it's getting bigger, the program's getting bigger, which is a good thing because it does include the whole South Central region. So when we look at uh, the population like in Paoli, which is a more underserved area um, and Greene County, we see some of our families that live in those areas that are, are a part of the program. Mm -hmm. The way um, a mother becomes, uh, is able to be taken into the program, it's a referral by the physician so that was a part of our work with our, our physician offices here in the South Central region, our OB offices, was to get them um, to actually do the ACE screen on their patients prenatally. And the key, uh, they do that at the first prenatal visit if possible, and that way we're getting them into services. The real key is to get them involved prior to 28 weeks of pregnancy. The nurse that is assigned to that family um, kind of becomes a member of the family. And a lot of it depends on the relationship that they build with the patient. We've had um, nurses that come to office visits, each office visit with that mom prenatally. Um, I, we had a patient in our neonatal intensive care unit at um, IU Health Bloomington who delivered her baby prematurely. And that nurse was her um, care provider and came into the, the unit with her during the course of those visits with her baby. They talked about the baby and the development. Um, they go to office visits. They'll go in, to, if the mother is actually working, they'll go to their jobs. So it really, it's kind of nurse to nurse, but they are really a part of that care team. And they follow that family once the baby's delivered up until the baby's about two to three years of age. At that time, um, many of the services, I'm, I'm not sure if you've all heard of First Steps before, but yeah. First Steps is a service that's out there and available. And typically at, at, um, uh, at delivery, we get them involved with First Steps services, mm -hmm. which looks at um, developmental growth, developmental, um, mental development and all of that, as well as physical therapy, occupational therapy if needed. Um, at three years of age, those services transition to the schools. So at that time, then they really, that's primarily when the nurse will kind of back off of that relationship, 
not to say that she doesn't maintain contact with those families mm -hmm. because we're seeing that now. The program's been up and run running long enough that you know, once the family gets on their feet, they've gotten the services that they need, um, mom's into a job or whatever the needs are, that the need for that relationship changes a little bit. It becomes mm -hmm. more of that friend um, to that mom, that yeah. mentoring, basically. Yeah. Thank goodness. Wow. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So really when you say that. you need extra volunteers for that, you, you need more of you need more nurses to yeah we need, and it's not really a volunteer um you know they need more nurses to do that the problem is funding for that so, yeah. it isn't a funded program very much it's through our community health division um so it's it really is a matter of just having uh the resources out there and that was where the family vitality initiative came from was kind of an offshoot of that to actually prepare resources for the offices so that nurse practitioners within the offices could be become more of that resource of getting the patients the services that they need. Well, thank thank you. you, Anne. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you. This is this is great. Uh, great community service. And if people didn't know about it, you know, it's not as powerful. And I think the fundraising has probably helped also. Yes. with uh, education about these important yes. programs. Yeah, I remember when the when the uh, nurse practitioner, when that program was started by the prosecutor about four years ago, and we didn't fully understand the impact that it would have, I think, at the time. We well, and I don't, we didn't have the resources either at that time. Yeah. Now that we've really identified that, we're able to really yeah. kind of move forward um, you know, having a survey and getting the results is one thing, but doing something with those results is entirely another. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. That was very enlightening. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You, Steve. So, okay, Aaron, I'm going to stop we... recording here. Thank Great. you. Okay. There we go. Goodbye.